I just want to now introduce uh, uh, Professor Annika Lukasen, who's the, the new director of the Centre for Personalised Medicine. Annika and I have known each other a long time, but also Annika has been a very good friend of Ethox for many years. And in fact, uh, before I even came to Oxford, I think that one of the first people I met in Oxford was Annika. She's always been very welcoming. I know many of you all know we've worked together over, over a very long time. I, uh, it's been, yeah, been a long time, 20 odd years or something. So very, very interesting and productive relationship. And I'm really looking forward to the next phase of that, the kind of the new Oxford project. So uh, Annika is going to introduce the, the talks and, and manage those. So I'll hand over to you now, Annika. Thanks very Brilliant. much. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Mike. And thanks so much for inviting uh, us to do the seminar. So it's not so much of a, a paper that we're presenting here rather than a, a collection of summaries and, um, and um, expanding the discussion about ways to work together as, as Mike says. Um, and I appreciate that, that many of you in Ethox have been involved in the CPM in, in some way since it started in 2013. Um, and indeed, Ingrid Slade, who was a, a Wellcome Trust um, uh, uh, research fellow at ESOX, was the first um, CPM um, director. And I've actually only been in post, um, despite the long history with Mike, <laughs> I've only been in post since the 1st of um, September this year. So there's a lot I don't yet know. Um, but because we've collaborated um, over that time um, with, for me, a different hat on, I think that it's a really good opportunity now to um, to build on ways that the, the two, um, that CPM and Ethox, as well as the Wellcome Trust Centre for Human Genetics and the Wellcome Trust Centre for Ethics and Humanities, um, can um, can work together. Um, so um, this is the um, mission statement um, for the centre for personalised medicine, uh, which is a partnership between the University of Oxford Wellcome Centre for Human Genetics and St Anne's College, Oxford. It's a communication engagement and research vehicle for students, academics, clinicians and the public to explore the benefits and challenges of personalised medicine. Um, and I've added research to this, it's not actually on uh, the website at the moment, but um, particularly with the expansion of the, um, res the research fellows attached to CPM, it's so obvious that that's what we're doing, and you're going to hear a bit more about that at the moment. So I think it's really important that that is part of, uh, is, is clearly part of what we do. Um, so on the left there, I've um, outlined the, um, it's a bit blurry, sorry, but um, the steering group uh, and outlined the people that are speaking today. Um, I'm going to give a quick preamble and then um, Porig, Nikki, Rachel and Catherine will spend five minutes each on their um, CPM related research and then I hope to have a discussion on some of the key aspects of personalised medicine that I think we might um, uh, collaborate on. Um, so I'll, I wanted to just start with my definition of personalised medicine because I think there's so many different versions of that around and, and in many ways it's sort of one of those terms that that doesn't have a, a clear definition and therefore isn't very useful in debate when people are coming at it from from different angles and I would say that um, medicine has always been personalized to some extent e even since the very earliest days of medicine so in in that sense I sort of agree with the reactions to the term um, about 10 years ago when it was introduced as well, you know, nothing new to see here because what is medicine if it's not personalised? But I think that a different take on that is a sort of recognition that um, over the last five to 10 years, we've seen a um, massive explosion in the amount of data that's gathered about people and that that indeed is still um, uh, increasing exponen exponentially, and that includes um, data about our uh, genetic code, so genomic information, and that we need to recognise that that data alone won't give us the answer. So it's not as simple as just um, putting a micro uh, um, magnifying glass up against the code and seeing what we're at risk of, um, but that we need to be, um, uh, that we have a responsibility to look at that data and interpret it. So it's not so much about celebrating the successes of technology, which of course we also need to do, but that we need, we have a responsibility to interpret that um, explosion 
um, and not assume that it will speak for itself. And that is what personalized medicine is. So personalized medicine is not just gathering it all and thinking of something to do with it later, but it's about um, tailoring that explosion of information to the patient um, or patients in front of you. Medicine's always been personalized to some extent. But over the last five to 10 years, there's been a massive explosion in the amount of data that we can gather about people. That data explosion extends from our Fitbit trackers to uh, kits we buy over the counter to being able to analyse our genetic code quickly and cheaply. And all those together really increase the opportunity to target interventions and, and medicines in a much better way. But in order to do so effectively, we really need to also pay attention to the ethical, legal and societal aspects that are involved in implementing those exciting advances um, in practice. The Oxford Centre for Personalised Medicine was formed in 2013 to engage and communicate with scientists, students and wider publics and to address a widening gap between the advancing science and the application and practice of personalised medicine. Multidisciplinarity is vital to the CPM mission. Biomedical and social sciences are represented within the team and steering group. We've engaged with and held events involving researchers in many different fields, including law, economics, bioethics, demography, and palliative care. We recently hosted Jennifer Doudna, who won the Nobel Prize for her work on CRISPR, to talk to us about this. We've also hosted COVID vaccine developers, epidemiologists, ethicists, genomic scientists and genetic counsellors and many, many more besides. The centre have also been working together with school children, inspiring an early interest in, in science and medicine and what that's going to look like in the future. We are always seeking innovative ways to engage. And that's exactly what the Centre for Personalised Medicine aims to do. Um, it really brings in a, a lot of diverse disciplines and expertise to look at the whole picture about personalising medicine. So this is just really to show people that there are lots and lots of different um, talks and seminars that we've hosted over the years. Um, many of these, th these are just some of them, um, and some of them go back to 2013. So Mike, you feature on here as well. But I think it is quite a nice illustration of the range of different activities and talks that um, CPM have done. Um, and we're also beginning to create an archive of animations and short films about issues. Um, so uh, um, polygenic risk scores um, animation is very, very um, nearly ready to go on the website. And another one about uh, learning healthcare systems. Um, and polygenic risk scores is the sort of new newish kid on the block. Um, in personalised medicine that, that tends to polarise debate um, uh, or, uh, yeah, that has, has sometimes polarised debate and one of the things that um, we want to do in the Centre for Personalised Medicine is get more to the, the centre of that debate, I suppose. And, you know, one end, it's a fantastic new tool used in personalised medicine um, where we use the entire genetic architecture to predict risk, um, the risk product of thousands or even millions of um, variants and their effect on disease. And on the other end of the debate, it's a, you know, it's a very weak predictor um, of common diseases whose susceptibility is usually only partially genetically determined um, and that our deterministic discourses about genetics commonly miss that. So, um, so I think it's a good example of where it's rare to see someone um, addressing the middle ground of, of a debate. So um, what I wanted to do was hand over to the um, four um, JRFs now to describe their research. Um, so, so thank you very much and uh, hello everyone. So as Annika said, I'm one of the four JRFs at the centre and I'm focused on the social science aspects of personalised medicine. Uh, my day job is as a health economist in the primary care department here in Oxford. And this is gonna be a very quick whistle-stop tour of some of my current and planned research uh, as it relates to personalized medicine. And um, also a very brief overview of some of my CPM activities. And if anyone wants to uh, shoot any questions to me now or after the seminar, I'll be very happy to uh, hear from you. Uh, so if we roll on to the next slide, please. So my, my work is about the wider economic 
uh, consequences of uh, genetic data very broadly defined, and that's encompassing two different areas, two different broad areas. One is looking at using genetic data and causal inference in relation to socioeconomic exposures and outcomes and the prediction of those outcomes. And also the use of polygenic risk scores in screening for uh, prevalent disease. Um, so then we go on to the next slide, actually. Okay, so um, the work on causal inference is using Mendelian randomization, which many of you will be familiar with, I guess. So this is useful in situations where we have confounded associations between, for example, disease status and some outcome. And a way of getting around that confounding is to use a genetic variation that predicts, uh, for example, disease status, but isn't uh, confounded by these other variables that jointly and independently determine um, the exposure and the outcome. And one of the advantages of doing this is that we can, um, A, get better evidence uh, for evaluating healthcare policy and for formulating those healthcare policies, because in principle, we could get uh, unconfounded um, effect estimates of exposures that are otherwise very difficult to study, including in randomized control trials. And we can also simulate the impact of interventions um, that we can never actually run in practice. Um, and so that's about developing and improving the evidence available for uh, policy evaluation. So if we go to the next slide, please. Then another angle of this is using um, genetic data to predict future healthcare costs, uh, rates of hospitalization, uh, rates of GP consultations. And to that end, I've done some initial work um, on a GWAS of uh, healthcare costs. And why would we do that? Well, one, one um, question that might answer is whether there are um, bits of the genome or, or genetic variations that predict uh, morbidity that isn't picked up when we look, look at these associations on a disease by disease basis. Uh, that GWAS was null, um, but the next step is looking at um, group level prediction. And there is some evidence that we can very slightly improve group le level prediction of future healthcare use and future healthcare costs using genetics. Um, and that work is gonna progress then into using disease specific polygenic risk scores in, in prediction. That gives rise to a whole host of um, uh, ethical issues, um, not all of which I'm uh, well positioned to answer, but one of these is whether it might affect access to insurance if data on common genetic variation is predictive. Um, and this lady on the right was featured um, in the New York Times about five years ago. She's in her late seventies. Her mother had Alzheimer's disease. She lives in the US. So in addition to the very significant health impacts, um, her mother also suffered very severe financial impacts. So um, this lady sent off um, a test to uh, 23andMe. She realized she um, had two bad copies of Apple before, and she had a family history of Alzheimer's. So she immediately took out long-term care insurance. And under uh, GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Disclosure Act of 2008, uh, insurance companies aren't um, able to ask her if she's taken that test, um, and she's not obliged to disclose it which is a classic case of asymmetric information. And enough people do this, then um, insurance companies will put up their price potentially to the point that no one could afford any insurance whatsoever. So this is, I guess, a new world. Um, if, if the evidence from that research does indicate that um, genetic, uh, common genetic creation is predictive of future healthcare costs and there are all manner of implications uh, for insurers. Um, and the final uh, bit of research is using uh, polygenic risk scores and cost-effective screening for disease. So sometimes in this debate, people are uh, talking past each other. I think if everyone in society had um, uh, were, were sequenced and we could create polygenic risk scores, we would almost certainly use that data in um, uh, risk prediction algorithms for all manner of diseases. However, we don't have that data and it would be extremely expensive to collect it and there are all manner of other uh, consequences, some of which we might foresee, some of which will probably be unforeseeable. Um, so the question then is, I think almost the first question is, um, should society spend a lot of money collecting this information, given that in some cases, the incremental value of a polygenic risk score in predicting future disease is probably limited. In other cases, it would be better. Um, I've recently finished a systematic review looking at uh, polygenic risk scores in screening for cancer, and they're all number of uh, limitations with that evidence. Um, and one, one of the limitations is it generally assumes away uh, differential coverage um, of polygenic risk by ancestry. 
which is a few different consequences. One is that it's uh, less available for non-European ancestries. It's also less predictive. So if society did decide to spend lots of money, it's possible that this might um, exacerbate health disparities since in many societies, only the most privileged people would have access to the best and most predictive uh, polygenic risk scores. Uh, next and final slide, please. Uh, so some of my CPM initiatives have been about introducing these social science um, questions and perspectives into the work of the center. Um, and that's included uh, talks and seminars and other events on, um, for example, the use of genetic data in education. Um, we had a talk last week on life insurance and polygenic risk scores, uh, as well as things like palliative medicine. And uh, next year, we hope to lead some sort of fireside chat or a constructive discussion on population level screening using uh, polygenic risk scores. And that might help um, educate people like the man on the right, who you might recognize if you read some of the more low-brow tabloid newspapers, um, who, who was told he had a very slightly higher relative risk for prostate cancer, but the absolute risk, uh, which is what matters, was really only increased by a tiny fraction and it wasn't actionable in any sense. Um, so I'll stop there and thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Porig. Uh, Nikki, are you online? I am, I'm here. Right. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so my name is Nikki Whiffen. I'm a, a group leader and Sir Henry Dale Fellow um, at the Wellcome Centre of Human Genetics. And here, uh, my team is focused on um, trying to find uh, genetic variants that are causative for uh, rare genetic disorders. Um, so this obviously has a very, uh, obvious link into personalized medicine. So a lot of these disorders are incredibly rare and the variants can actually be unique to a patient or their family. Um, so this is uh, truly uh, personalized medicine. Um, so just a little bit of an overview of kind of why we do this. So um, identifying uh, the genetic cause of a patient's uh, rare disease can be incredibly important, uh, both to them and to their family. Um, it allows us to uh, do familial screening uh, to identify other relatives that are also at risk, perhaps prenatally. And this allows us to do very personalized counseling around things like risk, recurrence risk. And sometimes a genetic variant is actually the first diagnosis that a patient ever gets. Maybe their disorder is something that we've never seen before. And actually having that genetic diagnosis is the first answers that um, a patient and their family gets. And this is sometimes after something, I think the average is about 75 uh, clinical appointments uh, trying to look into uh, what their condition might be. A genetic variant can also give us um, ideas about the prognosis. So how is this patient likely to do uh, clinically? And finally, uh, there's a huge promise that uh, identifying a genetic mutation uh, can actually lead us to uh, treatments. However, this is another uh, key issue in the uh, rare disease space, because often, as I said, these, these patients are N of 1 patients. And pharmaceutical companies have no interest in going after designing drugs for one patient. What well, they wanted to design drugs, they can make huge amounts of money off. Uh, so they focus on uh, relatively uh, common phenotypes. Uh, so we have this huge N of one issue, uh, not just in terms of uh, trying to identify which single variant is the variant that causes disease, which is a challenge in its own right, uh, but also how we might go about trying to treat uh, the one patient with um, a specific mutation. Um, there's kind of two promising avenues for this that I just wanna point out. One is uh, drug repurposing. So if we know uh, that a particular protein is knocked down uh, in a particular patient and we have a drug that targets that protein or something in the same pathway, we can perhaps repurpose it in, in this patient. I should have also put on here CRISPR. So I think in the video, you had me talking about our talk from uh, Jennifer Doudner. Uh, where she um, spoke about CRISPR therapeutics, which are hugely uh, promising for uh, N of 1 uh, patients, where we might be able to edit a single base change. And finally, uh, something that's really exciting is, is antisensology nucleotides, or ASOs. Um, so here, there are uh, some really awesome companies. Um, Ionis Therapeutics is, someone, uh, it's, it's a company in the States that works on this a lot, and actually a spin-out company from their initial founder, where he's pumped a lot of his own money into treating N of 1 patients, which is really quite inspiring. Uh, but the promise here is that you can have the same underlying technology uh, that will then allow you to um, target um, individual uh, variants, which I think is uh, quite um, a neat idea. Um, so that's kind of just a sum up of uh, 
what I think the kind of rare disease aspect of personalized medicine is, uh, all about kind of using genetic variants to find uh, answers for patients, and then um, in the hope that this uh, can give patients hope towards personalized treatment. Uh, in the CPM sphere, uh, I am involved uh, in, uh, as well as organizing uh, talks and things, and also I've um, spearheaded development of a blog. Um, so um, if you have any things that you think would be really, really interesting to see on our blog, uh, then I'd be really happy to interact uh, around that. Uh, thank you very much. Brilliant. Thank you, Nikki. Um, and next up is Rachel. Rachel, are you with us? Uh, yeah, hi. Thanks. Thank you. Hi. Um, would you mind clicking it in again, Annika? Um, sorry, I must have put a transition on it. All right, yeah. And again? I oh, meant to. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so my name is Rachel Wharton. I'm a new JRF at the CPM and a clinical training fellow in Annika's research group. Um, and I wanted to talk a bit about my research interest, which is what we should consider to be a gen genomic result. And I think this is very relevant to the work of the CPM because genomic results are so foundational to a lot of personalised medicine activities. But unless we've sort of critically appraised what we mean by them and are talking about roughly the same thing, um, it's really hard to build policy and practice and have useful debates around them. Um, so essentially, the issue is that if we did a genomic test on, on anyone in this meeting, we'd find four to five million ways in which our genetic code was different from the standard or reference code. And out of all of those millions of genetic variations has to be distilled the result of this test. Um, within those um, millions of variations, um, many will have no known impact on health that could be used to draw conclusions about where our ancestors might have lived. Um, some might be linked to traits or predispositions or diseases that might or might not affect us in the future or perhaps our family. Um, and loads will be heavily context dependent. So the meaning of a lot of genetic variations will vary depending on things like our age, our personal medical and family history, the kind of environmental risk factors we might have been exposed to, and things like, you know, the genetic code of our partner, and if we're planning to have children, could all have a bearing on what the particular genetic variations in our own code mean. Um, and there's also a lot that we don't know about what genetic variations mean, and lots that we probably think we know now, but might turn out to be wrong about. Um, and, and knowledge can advance in quite unpredictable ways but in contrast to a genetic code that remains pretty fixed throughout our lives. Um, so I guess one example would be um, the kind of genetic variations that we each have that might make us more or less susceptible to being very ill if we got COVID um, have been present in us since we were conceived, but didn't become medically meaningful until kind of the virus came into existence. Um, and that, that's just one example. There'd be many others of, of, of variations where it would kind of their significance is evolving as, as time goes by. Um, so I'm really interested in sort of when and why genomic variants are afforded that status of being a result and who, who should decide, how should they decide and when? Um, and I think it's a, an interesting question to ask because often the navigation from genetic code to result is couched as, a, as quite a technical process, as if it's developing the right strategy to find the needle in the haystack, but often underlying that is sort of an assumption that we would all know what a genomic result was when we then found it and that it's a sort of we're exploring looking for this thing that's passively lying there in the genetic code waiting to be found and I think that um, risks kind of disguising the many ethical choices we have as to when and whether and why to value particular genetic variations as being results um, and that's one of the things I'm really excited to explore in the context of the um, CPM. Um, Annika, would you mind clicking the slide thing again? Thanks. Um, one of the things I'm most excited to do is um, hopefully setting up a, an art competition for schools um, aiming to create art around themes of personalised medicine. And um, hopefully this year, the first time we're running it, we'll do a theme of healthcare data. Um, and I hasten to add that hopefully we'll get far better entries than the one on the slide, which is kind of aspirational on that entry. But um, I'm really excited to do that because I think so many of the choices we're making now about what we conceive to be genomic results, like, for example, out of a newborn's genome screen, what on earth we should be saying should be the results of that, will be having really profound implications for children who are at school at the moment. And I think involving them and, and kind of with these questions and seeing what they've got to say about it, I'm really excited to do. And that's the end of my... Thank you, Rachel. 
Catherine, over to you. Hello. Um, so, yeah, so I'm a junior research fellow at the CPM and I'm also a postdoctoral researcher um, in the Gorielli group at the Weatherall Institute of Molecular Medicine. And I'm just going to talk a bit about how my work relates to personalised medicine. And I think it's a little bit different from everybody else um, today. So we know that we can use personalised medicine to potentially alter people's treatments to provide better diagnoses, but something that we can also use genetic and genomic information for is to help guide reproductive decisions. And my work really lies in that borderline between clinical genetics, um, population genomics, and reproductive biology. Um, one of the main things that I work on is a group of um, mutations called de novo mutations or DNMs. And these are mutations which are present in an individual, but not apparently present in either of the parents. So they're sort of new in that generation. Um, de novo mutations are a really important source of um, genomic evolution, helping us to adapt and evolve as a species, but they're also intricately linked with dis um, diseases. And it's been suggested that approximately one in 300 live births for severe developmental disorders are caused by de novo mutations. So understanding how and why and when they arise is really important for our understanding of disease and, and kind of evolutionary biology. Um, and a subset of this is when we have a child born with a disorder caused by a de novo mutation, it is actually possible to predict um, using genetic information what the likelihood is that if the same parents had another child, what the, what the risk is of them having another child affected by the same um, de novo mutation and the same developmental disorder. So a study that I've been involved in in our group is known as the PregCare study. And what we've done is recruited over 60 families who are thinking about having another child. So this is preconception, but have already got a child affected by a DNM with a severe developmental disorder. And using genetic testing, looking at different tissues from the parents and the affected child, um, and ultra deep next generation sequencing, we've been able to give every single one of those family um, a personalized and accurate risk score between zero and 50%, depending on the family, of the likelihood that they would have another affected child. And in most cases, this recurrence risk is like next to zero. And we hope that that would provide reassurance to those parents that if they do want to have another child, it's very unlikely that they'll have another affected individual. And what we're doing now is working with genetic counselors to follow up on those families that we've provided these personalized risk scores to see whether or not that has actually influenced their decision about whether or not to have children. But I think it's a good example of how we can use um, next generation sequencing and genomics to help people make reproductive decisions. Um, next slide, please, Annika. Um, so the other part of my work also really focuses on de novo mutations. Um, and while it used to be thought that these occurred randomly, it's now been shown that the vast majority of DNM, so approximately 80%, are actually um, paternal in origin. So they come from the father's germline. Um, and we've found in our lab this process that happens in um, spermatogonial stem cells in the testes of all men, where a subset of de novo mutations in a particular pathway lead to um, selective advantage of spermatogonial stem cells that have this mutation, leading to clonal expansion as a man ages um, of these mutant cells. And what this means is that if a, um, if a man decides to have children, as he gets older, the likelihood of a sperm from this mutant clone of stem cells and um, being the one to fertilize the egg um, increases, and so a group, of, um, a group of disorders caused by these mutations basically um, are really linked to advanced paternal age. And these are known as paternal age effect disorders. Um, and this is a really prevalent thing. It happens in the testes of all men um, at all times. So my project is really focusing on understanding that process, understanding um, how these mutations arise, how they affect spermatogonial stem cell biology, and also the impact of advanced paternal age on the rate of de novo mutations. 
Now, this in particular has really important consequences in terms of personalised medicine and public health advice, given that in most modern societies, the average age of fatherhood is steadily increasing, and also understanding who is more at risk um, of passing on these types of mutations um, will help us to guide when and who should get non-invasive prenatal testing, which is really important for healthcare policy. Next slide, please. Um, so to finish off then, um, a couple of things that I've been kind of spearheading since I joined the CPM. So the thing that I'm probably most involved in at the moment is generating this flash interview video series, which is a series of, sort of five to 15 minute vlogs where I speak to lots of different people involved in personalized medicine in one way or another to get their opinions on what personalized medicine means to them, um, what they think about it at the moment, where we are in their field and where they think it might be going in the next 10 years and the challenges that might um, come up. So we've spoken to clinicians, I've spoken to lots of different researchers involved in different aspects of it. I've got some bioethicists lined up um, and it's a really good way of just kind of seeing how different people in different groups think about personalized medicine. Um, and the other thing which I'm working on with the um, student society is setting up a scientific careers mentoring scheme for, for students. So we've got undergraduate and postgraduate students who are interested in personalized medicine, and we're trying to pair them up with personal mentors, be that postdocs and DPhil students to offer careers advice, networking advice and skills support. Um, we're still open and looking for mentors. So if you are interested, um, please get in touch or I think the link has been on some of our tweets as well. So um, yeah, it'd be lovely to hear from you. Um, Brilliant, thank you, Catherine, that's great. Um, okay, so I thought I would um, just quickly show this event that I hope some of you will be attending tonight. So that is already a good example of how um, we do already collaborate, but it would be nice to think of other ways to um, keep this going. And that's the Being Human Festival that is on at the Museum of Modern Art um, this evening between um, seven o'clock and nine o'clock. And it's entitled Familial Fortunes. What do you really want to know about your DNA? Um, and with Viv Parry, who's a broadcaster involved in Genomics England, um, Mike and um, Sarah Wynn, who is CEO of Unique, and myself will be having a, a debate about um, the 100,000 um, uh, newborn babies that are um, going to be piloted um, uh, for whole genome sequencing um, uh, instead of the current heel. Uh, well, they'll still have a heel prick, but it'll be instead of the current heel prick test for newborn screening. And I think. I thought I'd finish just by sort of being provocative, really, with the same slide that I had up earlier, um, that I think newborn screening and this pilot is very much being sold as an example of the picture on the left, um, so that we can just sort of, by looking at the whole code, we can ramp up the current number of um, diseases screened from the, in the UK, it's nine at the moment, and the, um, the announcements around the pilot were that this could be ramped up to 200 or more, which sounds very appealing. Um, but arguably, I would say that doing that by whole genome sequencing is a bit more like the cartoon on the right, um, because using whole genome sequencing as the um, assay for newborn screening, for detecting rare diseases that arise in the newborn, I should say, is incredibly inefficient. So we will use less than point 0.1% of the data collected from a whole genome screen to detect hundreds of newborn diseases. Um, and arguably, there are much better ways of doing that using different assays or indeed using the assay we currently use um, to, uh, to find more diseases. And then the argument is much more about, well, what's the evidence that finding those diseases is of um, benefit? So my my provocation is, is the current um, drive to promote the pilot for whole genome sequencing um, being entirely honest with um, parents. Um, I think if we were explicit that actually what we want to do is collect a lot more data in order to be able to research it uh, over the next few decades, that might be closer to the, the real reasons for using this assay rather than um, other assays. And um, um, similarly, just to return to Polly 
pathogenic um, risk scores. I'm putting my clinical hat on here where um, uh, in, in the clinic, I, I, I see people with a family history of um, cancers um, and their polygenic risk scores are often sold as, um, as being incredibly discriminating. So the, the talks you see about polygenic risk scores are that the, if you compare the highest risk from polygenic risk scores with the lowest risk, then there is a, a several fold or many fold um, difference. And that makes it sound like they're very good at discriminating. Um, but as Porig said, actually, the important thing is not the relative risk, but the absolute risk. So um, if you um, translate um, in, in common cancers, if you translate the best available or at the best ever available polygenic risk scores for a cancer, you don't see massive changes in, um, in the risk that are conferred by those. Um, so just a few examples are that, you know, your average risk of breast cancer for a woman of 12% in her lifetime might go up to just under 20% with the best available polygenic risk scores, the best, you know, even better than they are available now, um, because um, not all of, a, of, of common diseases like cancer or indeed diabetes or heart disease are explained by genetic factors, many more um, environmental factors and random factors uh, have a role to play than can be tested for by um, polygenic risk scores. And so poor old Matt Hancock um, oft quoted, um, I think was a sort of classic example of realizing that his um, relative risk of prostate cancer was increased, but his absolute risk translated from, I think, a lifetime risk of 13% to a lifetime risk of 14%. Um, and indeed, his risk over the next 10 years was absolutely minuscule. So I think um, a really good example of how um, polygenic risk scores give you a bit of the picture. So it gives you the bottom of that picture and not the, um, and not the identifying part um, of the face of the, of the Mona Lisa. Um, so um, so I, I think I wanted to use those two examples um, to for us to think about what are ways that we can um, address the, the ethical and societal aspects of personalizing medicine. We know it's complex. We know it's driven by uh, lots of imagined futures um, uh, that are um, reliant on massive developments in technology rather than necessarily interpretation of that technology. We know there's a gap between the discourse about the power of big data and genomic predictions um, and the power to change medicine for an individual in an evidence-based way. Um, so how can we use that um, existing collaboration that we already have and build on it to address the, the complexity, paint the future realistically and reduce those gaps?